due to the fact that this is the final talk of this series, I would like to talk about the final topic associated with what we've been talking about. And so today I would like to talk about the results or fruit of uprooting, uprooting the idea of a self or an I associated with the five khandhas. So today we'll be answering the question, what are the benefits of uh, pulling out the self from the attachment to the five khandhas? As we discussed yesterday, in life we have, or the first question we must answer in life is, once we are born, what is it that we ought to receive? What should we accomplish in life? What ought to be accomplished? What ought to be attained or achieved? Or what ought to be received? through the living of life? This is our first question. We may not have achieved it or received whatever this thing is, but nonetheless, if we know what it is that should be received through life, then we will have some direction and it will make our practice much easier because we know where to aim and what direction to go. And so we need to know what it is that is, what the thing is that ought to be received in life. Now this thing which ought to be received once we've been born, we may not have realized this thing yet. We may not have any direct experience of it. But this doesn't mean that what we're talking about is useless. Although we do not have direct realization of this thing yet, of this benefit, nonetheless, we work at understanding it on the theoretical level first. We use our ability to think, to rationally think. We use this ability to develop an intellectual understanding of this thing that ought to be received in life. And so we, at this stage, even though there is no direct realization of this thing yet, we study it and we develop an understanding of it, even if only on and apps on a theoretical level. And this is to get us pointed in the right direction so we know where we're headed, which will save us a great deal of time and energy. So don't complain that what we're talking about is too ideal or it's purely intellectual. We can't make you see this thing. We can't make you realize it just by our talking that's something you must do on your own. All we can do is begin this studying and thinking about this thing to, to get a proper intellectual understanding of what it is. And then it's up to you to take it from there. Now what we're, the, the way we are speaking here is metaphorically, figuratively, we're using similes and metaphors to describe something that is mental and immaterial. We use examples or metaphors from the physical world, which we all know so very well. We take these common everyday examples of physical things, which you already understand, and we use these as metaphors for the, the mental situations and activities and for the spiritual truths which 
cannot really be expressed directly in words. So understand that this is the way we're speaking. We're using metaphors. And don't, don't think that the words we're using here are meaningless or, or empty of any value. When we are able to end attachment to the five khandhas, we say that we are released from the five khandhas or we are freed from the five khandhas. What we really mean here is that we are released from attachment to the five khandhas, but to put it most simply, we usually just say, by ending attachment to the five khandhas, we are released from them. But we mean the thing that we're really released from, we're let free of, the attachment in the five khandhas. This is like being like a prisoner or convict, being let out of jail, being released from prison, or we even escaping from, from jail. It's the same situation. The prisoner gets out of the shackles and chains and handcuffs and outside the bars and beyond all the guards and TV cameras and everything and is free, is released from this prison. The prison we're talking about here is the attachment to the five khandhas. This is the prison of life that we're so, so thoroughly stuck in. We're trapped within this prison of life because of our attachment to it. But through ending attachment to the five khandhas, we are released from this prison which we make out of that attachment. When we say the five khandhas here, this includes all things that exist in the world, all the various worldly phenomena are included in one khanda or another. So when we talk about being freed of the five khandas, we're talking about being freed of everything whatsoever, released, escaped from all the various, all the various things which we have attached to. So this is what we mean by saying, by ending attachment in the five khandas, we are released from the five khandhas. Now generally when we speak in the ordinary way we say we escape from the prison of life or we are released from the prison of life. You understand now what we mean by the prison of life, this prison built out of attachment in the five khandhas. We have to remind you that when we say the word we, what we're really talking about is the, the jitta, the mind or heart. And so if we're going to speak more accurately, then we need to say the mind, the jitta, is released from, is liberated from the prison of life. In the common way of speaking, we use the word we, but those of us who understand the Dhamma realize that there is no such thing as a we. And so it's more proper to use the word the jitta, the mind or heart. And so it's the mind which escapes from the prison of life, which is released from this prison built out of attachment. So the first benefit of pulling out this attachment in the five khandhas is to be released or liberated from the prison of life. This is something that is discussed in all religions. In all the various religions you have something, you either have salvation, deliverance, liberation, release, something of this sort. In Buddhism, we can use the word liberation 
or being le- released from, and it has the meaning which we have just described. This is the first of the benefits. The second benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas is freedom, is having the being in a state of freedom. Once the jitta, the mind heart, is released from the prison of life, then it is free. It is to it is free to do whatever needs to be done according to its mindfulness and wisdom. The mind that is free uses mindfulness and wisdom, sati banya, and does what it needs to do. It is free to do this. It is no longer hindered in doing the right thing by the defilements. It is free to do the correct thing. So this is the second benefit. There's a very useful Pali word that describes this state of freedom. In Pali, the word is viveka, V-I-V-E-K-A, or viveka. And in Thai, it's pronounced we wake. We wake up is, can be translated as singleness or oneness. It's a state of singleness or oneness of the mind where it is at such a level of oneness that there is nothing which comes and disturbs the mind or afflicts it bothers it or annoys it in any way. The, the mind is in such a state of oneness or singleness that nothing disturbs it. This is the kind of freedom we're talking about that is the second benefit of pulling out the attachment from the five khandhas. So the second benefit is freedom. And we're not talking about freedom in the usual worldly sense that people are fighting revolutions for all over the world. We're talking about freedom or liberation in the Dhamma sense. The third benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas is cleanliness. We are clean. We become clean by removing this attachment. Usually, through this attachment, we're quite filthy. The mind is very dirty because of the defilements, the gilesa. The literal meaning of the gilesa are dirty things, impurities. And so, we are filthy and impure because of these gilesa and the gilesa arise because of attachment. So by removing this attachment, then we become clean. We clean up the defilements, the gilesa. We clean up the anutsaya, the defiled tendencies. And we clean up the asava, the defiled outflows. We've discussed these three aspects of defilement the gilesa, anutsaya, and asava in an earlier talk. And all of these things are are purely filthiness. They're just three aspects of dirtiness. The gilesa is the external dirt. The anutsaya is the dirt that is stored away inside, in the depths of the mind. And then the asava are that the flowing outward, the squirting or leaking outward of that dirt. Through removing attachment, all this defilement and dirtiness is cleaned up. And so then we, the jitta, is clean. Once again, we're talking about clean in the dhamma sense, in a dhamma meaning of the word. We're not talking about it in an ordinary worldly sense. So this cleanliness 
in the Dhamma sense is the third benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas. The fourth fruit to mention is that we can stop running. The fourth benefit is being able to stop running. We can use an example of this, your own condition, your own situations. You've all run from America, Europe, Australia, someplace you're running from somewhere. And before long, you'll be running from Su and Mok, running off in some other direction. You're running here and there because of, because of desire, because of wanting to get this or get that, because of the power and influence of desire. You're running, running one way, running another way. You're always running somewhere. This desire comes from attachment to things, to attachment in something. And all of these things which you're attaching to fit in within the five khandhas. So all this running back and forth, to and fro, this endless running can be stopped by pulling out that attachment in the five khandhas. Without that attachment, there will be no desire, no ignorant craving. And then one can stop running. Now when we say stop running, another way of talking about this is to say, or this, this state of constantly running is, in a broader sense, can be explained as being born over and over again. Being born once, being born again, being born again. Constantly being born over and over again and again. Born in this state, born in that state, born in another state. Born with this desire, born again in this desire, born again in a different desire. Being born over and over again. Or running back and forth, to and fro, constantly. The fourth benefit is that this stops all this being born over and over again, or this running back and forth stops. But when we say the, the running back and forth stops, it doesn't mean that you stop, because with the end of attachment there's no more you to stop. So the running stops, there's no more running back and forth, but there's nothing to stop. There's no thing or I or self that stops. So not only is there no running, there's no going, there's no coming, and there's no staying in one certain place. So there's neither coming or going or stopping in a certain place. With all the running to and fro, there is no rest. There is no chance to relax and find peace. But when the running stops and there is no coming or going and no stopping either, then there can be peace. This is the fourth benefit of removing attachment within the five khandhas. The fifth benefit is coolness. By removing attachment in the khandhas, there is coolness, or nibbana. This word coolness is directly translatable by the word in Thai, nipan, or in Pali, nibbana. It's all that nibbana means, is coolness. But we have to understand this coolness properly. Some people have the misunderstanding that Nibbana means death. And there are many Western scholars who have made, shown their ignorance of Buddhism, such as Freud, by equating Nibbana with death. This is to completely under, misunderstand what is meant. Nibbana means coolness. And we can give many examples of this coolness that we're talking about. For example, 
a burning coal, burning charcoal from a fire. When removed from the fire, it will, the, it will be glowing red because it is so hot. But then it will cool down. It will no longer be red. It will be black or gray. And when it is no longer hot, then we say that that charcoal is Nibbana. It is cool. Or, say, rice that is being cooked on a fire. The rice must be boiled, and so it is very, very hot. But then when it is removed from the fire, after a period of time, we can say the rice is Nibbana. It is cool enough to eat. These are some physical examples of Nibbana. The word Nibbana means when something hot, when some fire becomes cool, that coolness is Nibbana. When any fire calms down and becomes cool. We've given you these physical material examples first, but the fires we're talking about, when we're talking about the real meaning of Nibbana, aren't the physical fires with, with which we cook rice or burn things. We're talking about the fires of the mind, which we mean the defilements, the gilesas. If you've honestly looked at these things, you realize that they are truly fires. The defilements are fires which are burning the mind. The cool, when these defilements become cool, that coolness is Nibbana. When these fires go out, that is Nibbana. But most of us don't even realize this. We're not really aware of these fires in the mind. And so we have trouble understanding what is meant by spiritual coolness. To help you understand this, we can talk about two kinds of fire. You'll have to listen very closely because this will sound a bit strange to you. But there are two kinds of fire. There are fires that are wet, that are wet, and fires that are dry. When we talk about fires that are wet, we're talking about lust and greed. We're talking about sensual desire, which includes sexual desire. These very strong desires and lusts or passions, these are what we mean by wet fires. And most of you are so enamored by these wet fires, you enjoy them so much that you don't realize how hot they are. This is one kind of fire, the wet fires of sensual desire, of, of lust and passion and greed. The other kind of fire is the dry fires. This is the fire of anger, of, of hatred, of ill will. So there are these two kinds of fire, both wet and dry. When these fires go out, there remains coolness or Nibbana. This Nibbana has nothing to do with death, so please don't confuse it. It's the going out of hot things the going out of the fires. This is Nibbana, which is the fifth benefit, the fifth fruit of the removal of attachment from out of the five khandhas. Now the sixth benefit is that you will be someone who is free of doubt and uncertainty. There will be no doubt or uncertainty within the mind. You won't have, you will no longer have to ask questions of other people. You won't have to ask people, what is this? What's it like? Why is it like this? And what do I do about it? We don't have to, no longer, we no longer need to ask these questions of what is it? What are its characteristics? Why is, why, why is it like this, and what, or how should I do, or what should I do about it? 
We don't have to ask these questions anymore because we are now free. The mind is free of doubts and uncertainty. The mind is free of doubts because it no longer has any craving. The mind no longer has any ignorant desire to get or to be, to get rid of or not be. Because there are no longer these desires, it doesn't have to run around looking for these answers to the questions of what is it, what's it like, why, and what do I do about it? This, in the, in the language of Dhamma, this means to have, we say, is to transcend doubt or to raise the mind above and beyond all doubt or to have crossed over the ocean of uncertainty, to be completely free of all these doubts, to no longer have to ask these questions anymore. This is the sixth benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas. Another way to put this in more simpler terms is because of the coolness of Nibbana, you no longer will have to use the words what, where, when, why, how, and mm -hmm. all the other words like that. In fact, we can just take them all out of the dictionary. We can free the dictionary of these words such as what, where, when, how, why, wherefore, etc., etc. This is the benefit of ending uncertainty. This is the sixth benefit of removing attachment. The next benefit is that one is free of the domination of the pairs of opposites. By the pairs of opposites, we mean all the various dualities such as good and evil, positive and negative, gain and loss. These pairs, and there are dozens of them, are dominating our lives. They have a tremendous influence. They have a tremendous influence over our lives, over the minds, and are constantly afflicting the mind in different ways, forcing it this way and forcing it that way, according to the power and influence of these pairs of opposites. But by removing attachment, which is the source of all this duality, then the mind is freed from this domination and these pairs of opposites are no longer able to afflict the mind. They're no longer able to disturb the mind or force it to go in one direction or another. Most of us are really caught up in these things, in good and bad and all these other distinctions, all these dualisms. But this is the way of viewing life that is foolish. All these pairs of opposites belong only to, to fools. The fool will say, oh, this is good, that is bad. This is a gain, this is a loss. This is winning, that is losing. This is good, that's bad, this is positive, this is negative. This is the talk of fools, the people who talk like this and actually believe that it is true. But someone who is truly intelligent will not make all these discriminations. The person who is truly intelligent will realize that there's no good and there's no bad, but there is only being centered and balanced in what we call the void. This being centered in the void is completely free of the influence and intimidation of all these different opposites, pairs of opposites which are swirling around us. This is what this being outside or being out from under this, this domination 
is what we mean by being free of the pairs of opposites. This, this is exactly what is being talked about in the third chapter or the, the third chapter of the first book of Gen- wait, third chapter, yes, of Genesis, in which God forbids Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What God is saying is, don't attach to good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil means attachment to this as good and that as bad, which is to put one under the domination and power of the pairs of opposites. But if one obeys God's command, which very few people do, no matter how devout they claim to be, they still don't listen to God, and they still go and attach to the pairs of opposites, especially the first. So by moving attachment in the five khandhas, these, the mind, is no longer under the influence of these pairs of opposites. We can use the word duality, discrimination, or whatever you want, but the clearest word or phrase is the pairs of opposites, because then you see very clearly that there are these opposing things. And the mind that is wise will get free of that opposition in conflict. By ending this attachment, then one will be truly a good Christian. The mind will be cool and peaceful, and one will have finally obeyed God's command. The eighth fruit of removing attachment in the five khandhas is that we end desire. It's the end of desire. Now we have to be careful about this word desire because it's often confused. And so let us explain a little bit what we mean. We can talk about wise wanting. And on the other hand, we can talk about ignorant desire or craving. So you have to learn the difference between these two because it's very important. And the confu- by confusing these two, one becomes very lost and has no idea of how to live properly in the world. There is a kind of wanting or desiring which is based in foolishness or in avicca, not knowing. Because of the lack of knowledge, because of ignorance or stupidity, There are certain kinds of desire and craving which automatically lead to dukkha. No matter what, these desires always condition dukkha because they are based in ignorance. They're based in not understanding reality. And so they inevitably lead to dukkha. This is one kind of desire, the desire, the ignorant desire or craving that is rooted in and accompanied by ignorance, by avicca. But on the other hand, there is what we can call wise wanting. Wise wanting is not accompanied by ignorance and has not been conditioned by ignorance. Wise wanting is just a matter of seeing what needs to be done and doing it. And in that, no dukkha will arise. Ignorant desire will always give birth to the self, to the I. The I who wants, the I who desires. But when there is wise want, there is no I who wants. There is just what needs to be done, and it is done. And no I who attaches to and is attached to this process. So these are the two, two kinds of wanting. Wise wanting, which is not a problem, and ignorant desire, which is a cause of dukkha. 
by ending attachment in the five khandas, this ignorant desire ends. This is the eighth benefit. When we talk about ignorant desire, we should also point out that there are three kinds of ignorant desire. The first kind of craving is the desire to get, the desire to get something. There is something that the self wants. There's this desire to get something. Then there is the desire to be, to be something, to be this, to be that, to be rich, to be beautiful, to be whatever. And the third kind of craving is the desire to die, the desire to not be, to die. All these are totally ignorant and inevitably lead to dukkha. And if you understand that the desire to die, or if you understand that Nibbana has nothing to do with death, then you will understand how silly it is to want to die, to want to commit suicide. So these are the three kinds of ignorant craving which you need to distinguish from wise wanting. The ending of attachment will end this ignorant craving and then there will be no more hunger, no craving, no hunger, no thirst. The mind is totally at ease because it is no longer hungering to get, to be, or to die. This is the eighth benefit. The ninth benefit is that the mind is above all conditioning. We're afraid that this way of phrasing it will be difficult for you to understand, but we've got no better way of stating it. So we'll just stick with our original phrase. The mind is above the conditioning. What we mean is that there is what the Buddha called Sankara, which has the meaning of conditioning. This is the when various factors or causes has an influence on the mind which conditions it in one way or another. This conditioning is a compounding of further causes and effects. And so this is the process of con- conditioning that is going on. This benefit is that the mind is above that process of conditioning. It's free of the conditioning and that it is truly at peace. There are many different ways that we can explain and describe this conditioning. There are many words we can use. For instance, there is nothing that is exploiting the mind or nothing treading upon the mind. This conditioning is like something walking upon the mind, stepping on it, stamping on it. The mind is free of this. It's free of the conditioning. It's free of the being dominated by these things. It's, it's no longer under the influence of these things. It's no longer controlled by them. It's no longer stimulated by them, no longer incited by them, no longer pulled off and dragged around in different directions by these things. These, all these various things end when re- attachment is removed from out of the five khandas. And then the mind is in a state that we call unconditioned. This conditioning the Buddha called Sankara and the state of conditioning Sankata. And then the Buddha talked of Visankara, meaning outside of or being unconditioned. 
And so the mind will realize or penetrate to a state of visankhara, where there is nothing conditioning it. And in this state of being free of conditioning, where nothing has the power to incite or overwhelm or influence or dominate the mind, then the mind is truly calm, cool, and peaceful. This is the ninth benefit. This ninth benefit is something you can use in your daily lives. You can use it each and every day of your lives, beginning right here and now. Another way of stating this is that the mind doesn't tremble, it doesn't shake, or to put it most simply, the mind doesn't move, it doesn't move. What we mean by this is when some famous person, some honored and famous person comes to your house, the mind starts to shake and tremble, it's, it's moving. Or when a beggar comes to your house, then the mind's shaking again, it's moving. Even when the postman comes to your house, which is in no way a strange event, when he brings a letter or telegram, the mind moves. The mind is always shaking or moving in some way, all day long. It's, it's always moving. When you go to watch, say, acrobatics at a gymnasium or on TV, the mind is moving. Or you watch a football match, the mind's moving because of the football match. Or whatever sports, or when you go to a concert or a movie or a play, listening to music, the mind is moving. The mind is always moving. If you like this, if you find it peaceful and relaxing, well then, go ahead and do it. But if you realize that all this movement of the mind is too much, that it's tiring, that it's disturbing, that it's impossible for the mind to be clear and peaceful with all this moving, with all this shaking and trembling going on, if you, if you understand this, then you'll see the value of ending the conditioning of the mind, all this shaking and movement of the mind. By removing the attachment to the five khandhas as I or mind, by pulling out this attachment, all this movement of the mind ceases, and then the mind is truly peaceful. This is something that you can practice each and every day of your life. You can practice this living where the mind is not always moving in response to all these conditions. This is the ninth benefit of removing attachment to the five khandhas. The tenth benefit is light or brightness or we can say radiance. This is the tenth benefit of removing attachment in the khandhas. We're not talking about the ordinary light that comes from electric light bulbs, fires, or the stars in the sky. We're not talking about this kind of light, about physical light. We're talking about spiritual brightness or radiance. So we can comp to help you understand this, we can compare it with the darkness of avicca. As we explained, avicca or not knowing is not realizing the truth of things. And this is a kind of darkness that cannot be dispelled no matter how many hundreds of suns or how many floodlights or flashlights or whatever you have. No matter what, that darkness will still be there, even in broad daylight. This is the darkness of avicca. On the other hand, 
this radiance or brightness which we're speaking of, no matter how dark it is, it may be the night of the new moon, and it may be very cloudy and you don't see any stars, it may be pitch black, but still this radiance will be there. The radiance we're talking about will be able to shine forth no matter how dark the surroundings are, no matter how dark a place you are, this brightness will remain and will shine forth. This is the brightness or radiance of realizing what we call the Paramatha Satcha, which is the highest, the most highest truth. Realizing the most highest truth is to realize that there, are, there is nothing whatsoever which ought to be attached to. There is nothing whatsoever that can be attached to without getting burnt. Nothing at all. This is the highest truth. Realizing it is a brightness or radiance that fills one's life. In fact, life becomes this radiance through realizing the truth. Most of us don't realize the things the way things are. But this brightness is to, to see things in their reality. With the easiest way to say it is the brightness is seeing according to reality. Seeing according to reality. This is something you need to remember. This is the meaning of brightness. But on the other hand, at this time, we don't see according to reality. And so instead, there is the darkness, the, the foolishness of seeing not according to reality, seeing in discord with reality. Our, our vision, our way of seeing things does not match up with truth and reality. And this is a great darkness. But this lightness, this brightness, and radiance of seeing according to reality can illuminate our lives and then our lives become that radiance. And so we're not talking about the physical light that comes from the sun or the moon or a fire. We're talking about this spiritual light which is the meaning of enlightenment. When we talk about enlightened beings, this is the light we're talking about. They are illuminated by this spiritual light, the light of the Dhamma eye, the light of seeing things as they really are, seeing the impermanence, the dukkha, and the anatta of things. The eleventh benefit is being a person who does nothing, who never does anything wrong, or put it a little more directly, being someone who does not make mistakes. Now, there's a very common saying in the world which most of you probably subscribe to. And this saying is, the person who makes no mistakes is the person who doesn't do anything. If you don't do, if you don't make any mistakes, then you're not doing anything. This is a common attitude in the world, and we would like to very directly point out that this is completely wrong, it's crazy, and it's stupid. To say that the only way to not make mistakes is to do absolutely nothing, is to be very foolish and not understand life at all. So we want to be on the record as completely disagreeing with this, this foolish saying. And we encourage you to all give it up and forget about it. There is no truth in the saying that the person who makes no mistakes is someone who doesn't do anything at all. It is possible 
to make no mistakes whatsoever. By ending attachment, by ending attachment to all things or to the five khandhas, then there will be no more mistakes. By not allow, allowing the, the I, the self, to arise, by seeing things as they really are, there will not be any more mistakes. There will not be the errors of ignorance. So it is completely possible to live, to do all sorts of things, to do whatever needs to be done. Whatever needs to be done can be done. There can be all kinds of doing this and doing that, but without any mistakes or errors. This is completely possible. So please give up the idea that the person who doesn't make mistakes is the person who doesn't do anything at all. Give this up and then you might be able to realize the eleventh benefit of ending attachment in the five khandhas, which is to be a person who makes no mistakes. The twelfth benefit goes together with the eleventh. It's they form a pair. The eleventh one is making no mistakes. And when there are no mistakes, then we have the twelfth benefit, which is doing everything correctly. Everything that is done is done correctly. All the work, deeds, activities, and duties of life can be done correctly whether they are intentional or unintentional. Even unintentional actions will be done correctly. This is the twelfth benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas. Whatever has to be done in life, obtaining food, finding clothing, bathing oneself, exercising the body, the necessary thinking and learning, that is part of life. All these things which mis must be done in life will be done correctly. There will not be any mistakes. Everything is done correctly, rightly. And when this happens, the mind becomes content. When everything in life is correct, all the necessities of life are done and taken care of correctly, the mind is very, very content. And we call this Dhamma PT. PT means contentment. Dhamma PT is being content in Dhamma, which means being content in correctness. Normally, for the average sentient being, contentment only comes with the gilesa. The defilements are satisfied. Anger is vindicated. Greed is satisfied in one way or another. And this, and then the, the gilesa are content. And through our attachment to the gilesa, we think that we are content. But it's really just the defilements are content. And we attach to that. This is a very low kind of contentment. But through doing everything correctly, there is the contentment of Dhamma, the contentment of doing everything correctly. When life operates in this way, when life is managed in a way that is always correct, then you can do something which you've probably never heard about before. So please listen. If if life is correct in every movement, every activity, every thought, word, and deed, then one can bow to oneself. At the beginning of all these talks, you bow down to something outside yourself. But if you really want to bow, the highest meaning of bowing or paying respects or saluting is not to do it to some external thing, but to bow to one's own correctness, to have passed through a day without making, to have lived a day 
with only correctness, having maintained life is in correctness, then one can bow to oneself, one can bow to that correctness and can experience that contentment in Dhamma. This ability to bow to oneself, this is the twelfth benefit of ending attachment to the five khandhas. In the third, thirteenth benefit, we want to stress something we've already touched on. And this benefit is that we will be completely above, beyond, and outside of the influence of good and evil. Good and evil will no longer have any power or influence over us. Let us emphasize that there is nothing more hateful, ugly, and disgusting than good and evil. Now this might be something that is a little too high for the average person to understand. There are a lot of people who just can't understand what is being said here. But we are speaking on the level of ultimate truth. And so we're going to say what has to be said. And this is that there is nothing more dangerous and fierce and ugly and hateful than good and evil. Good and evil have all kinds of dangerous influence over us. Something is good and we laugh like fools. Something is evil and we cry like maniacs. Good and evil is leading us to cry and laugh like fools and cr insane crazy people all the time. This is disgusting and terrible. This is the, this shows how fierce good and evil are. If there is no attachment, then good and evil cannot have this power over us. The, to show that the, the importance of this fact, we'd like to point out that the first thing that God says to mankind, if you study the book of Genesis, the first thing that man says, the first teaching and instruction which mankind gives is to Adam when he says, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you will die. Good and evil is the cause of death. And God pointed this out to mankind right from the beginning. Unfortunately, mankind has never bothered to pay any attention to what God says. And so we ignore this ultimate truth. Good and evil are fierce and horrible. Through attachment, we allow good and evil to lead us into all kinds of foolish and silly acts and to get up in all kinds of conditioning and turmoil and dukkha. So by removing attachment in the five khandhas, we finally begin to obey God's command we do what God tells us, and then there is true freedom. The mind is free of this fierce and powerful domination of good and evil. Good and evil can no longer do their tricks upon the mind, and so we are truly free. We know the, the genuine peace that comes with true liberation. This is the thirteenth benefit of removing attachment in the five khandhas. When we talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have to be careful about this word knowledge, and so we'd like to analyze it a little bit here. It seems that there are two kinds of knowledge. There is the kind of knowledge that leads to attachment and the kind of knowledge that leads that does not lead to attachment or leads away from attachment. Obviously what God is talking about or what this tree about is about is the knowledge that leads to attachment. 
So this is the knowledge of good and evil that causes attachment to good and evil. That's the kind of knowledge that is meant by this tree and by its fruit. The fruit of the tree is the attachment. The knowledge is the kind of knowledge that leads to attachment. Actually, we wonder if this has been translated properly because we know that knowledge is an English word. Unfortunately, we don't understand the old Hebrew with which the book of Genesis was written. And so we don't have the scholarly ability to check and make sure that knowledge is really the correct word. Maybe the word might should be something like misunderstanding or something like that. But since we don't have this ability, maybe if one of you has the knowledge about languages to do this, we encourage you to to check up on this matter. But until then, we'll just have to take it that there are two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge that leads to attachment, which we can say is incorrect knowledge. It's not the knowledge that sees according to reality. It's not true seeing and vision of genuine reality. On the other hand, there is the kind of knowledge which does not lead to attachment, and this we call correct knowledge. So the correct, the incorrect knowledge of good and evil is that is to discriminate between good and evil and then attach to them. This is incorrect knowledge. But the correct knowledge of good and evil, which does not lead to death, the correct knowledge of good and evil is that there's no such thing as good and no such thing as evil, that these are just illusions. This is the correct knowledge because it does not lead to attachment. Now we're speaking on the level of highest truth. If you don't understand what we're, spe- we're explaining completely, then please don't go off with any half-baked ideas. But work on it and think about it until you have a complete understanding of what is being discussed. This being free of good and evil, of this incorrect knowledge about good and evil, is the thirteenth benefit. Ajahn Buddha Dasa says that we're using a Bible that has been translated from the Greek and that the Greek must have been translated from the Hebrew. So, if anybody knows Greek, you can check up the Greek. But we still don't know if somehow the translators into Greek made any mistakes. So we're not sure still whether the word knowledge is the word that should be used in relation to this tree that we're talking about. But nonetheless, whatever the word is, isn't as important as understanding the truth involved here. The truth that through attachment to good and evil, there will be spiritual death or dukkha. The next benefit is that we will have a new life that is enjoyable through helping others. Or we can say we will have a good time through helping others. He wanted me to be very careful how to translate the Thai word sanuk, and I did my best. You can say to enjoy life, to have an enjoyable new life, by helping others. When there's no more attachment to self, then there isn't the selfishness arising which makes it very difficult to truly help others. So when we take away this attachment, it is able, we are able to help others, and not in a grudging, painful way. Not as some People don't have to pay us to do it, or trick us into do it, or bribe us 
in some way. But we are willing to help others just because it's enjoyable, it's pleasant, it's, it's fun. We learn that this is the best way to have a good time, is to help others. And as we realize this, we realize also that in helping others, we're helping the entire world. And we are part of that world. So helping others is to help ourselves. And so we have this new life in which there is great enjoyment. We have a really good time in helping others, in helping ourselves, in helping the entire world. The fifteenth benefit is that we will feel warm-hearted through having nothing but friends throughout the entire universe. We will have a very warm-hearted feeling in knowing that there is no one or nothing that is not our friend. Throughout the entire universe, we only have friends. Because everyone or everything is our friend, we have nothing to fear. And so this warm-heartedness is, has a, within it a deep feeling of safety and security. There's this warm-heartedness that comes from realizing that everyone is our friend and comrade in birth, friend in illness, friend in aging, and friend in death. We're all friends throughout the entire universe. And so we, we can be secure in this warm-hearted feeling of friendship. This is the 15th benefit of removing attachment to the five khandhas. The next benefit, the 16th one, is that we will have ayatana that are heaven. The ayatana, if you remember, are the sense spheres. So this is that we will have sense spheres that are heaven. We'll have to let us point out that when we say sense spheres, this includes both the six internal sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and the external sense objects, the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and thoughts. Altogether, these 12 things are what we call the ayatana. But often we only talk about the sense organs. We'll just mention the ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, and mind. But when we do so, we're implying the sense objects because the eyes are meaningless without sights. We only know of one or the other because of the interaction between the two. So they always come in and an inseparable pair, eyes and sights, ears and sounds, and so forth. So even though we only say the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, we're still talking about the sense objects as well. In fact, let me clarify that when we say eyes, we're including all of the physical visual apparatus, which includes, includes the eyeballs, the optic nerve, the part of the brain that's involved in sight, and also the, the medium, the air through which the light travels from, from the sight or form that is seen. So all this is what's included in the ayatana, all the, vi all the sensory apparatus and all the sensory objects. These are the ayatana. And these ayatana will be heaven through removing attachment in the five khandhas. When the Buddha arose in India, when the Buddha appeared in India, the common belief of almost everyone was that somewhere way up in the sky, who knows exactly where, but way up high is heaven. And 
down below in the depths of the earth is a place called hell. And this is what just about everybody believed. Now the Buddha didn't go and deny this, but he didn't agree with it either. He neither denied nor certified this common belief in some heaven up in the sky and a hell down in the bowels of the earth. Instead, what the Buddha said was that the Buddha said heaven and hell are at the ayatana. Heaven and hell are at the ayatana. The meaning of this is that when there is any sensory experience such as seeing, if that seeing is correct, then that will be heaven. If the seeing is incorrect, it will be hell. So heaven and hell arise at these ayatana by whether the it is correct or incorrect. By correct, as you should already understand, if there is attachment to the seeing, if there is liking or disliking, and then desire and attachment in the birth of the eye, all of this compounded by ignorance, then that will be hell. That is incorrect seeing, and it is hell, or dukkha. But if the seeing, or hearing, or whatever, is correct, meaning that there is no ignorance, but instead there is mindfulness and wisdom supervising or managing the sense experience, that will be heaven. So by correct seeing, correct hearing, and so forth, the ayatana are heaven. This is the sixteenth benefit of removing attachment to the five khanda. Now we come to the seventeenth benefit of removing this attachment. This benefit is to be free of, be out from under the power of bhava. Those of you who have not studied Buddhism very much will not have, will probably not be familiar with the word bhava, so we will explain it. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to translate. The literal meaning is becoming. So this is to be free of the power of becoming. What is meant here is that when there is attachment and there arises this <coughs> thought or idea of an I or self, then there is a self that becomes. This becoming of the self is what is meant by bhava. It's often also translated existence because once there is the becoming, the coming into existence, then there is existence or being. And so we can translate bhava as becoming, existence, or being. This existence or becoming is always dukkha. Once there is this becoming, there will be dukkha. And so to be out from under the power of bhava is to free oneself of dukkha. The Buddha said that even the smallest, tiniest particle of bhava is still dukkha. Even the most minute, minuscule bit of bhava is dukkha. It's like if we took a very small bit of excrement, no matter how small it is, it will still smell. It'll smell bad. Bhava is the same way. No matter how small a particle of bhava there is, even this tiniest amount of becoming is still dukkha. And so if you understand this, then you'll see the, the benefit in being out from under the dominance and power of bhava, of becoming or existence. This 
this word that <coughs> I pronounced bhava is spelled B-H-A-V-A and my pronunciation has been corrected to pa wa if I make it pa wa that's a different word with a different meaning so I'll try to say it properly pa wa pop or in Thai it's very easy pop <laughs> so this we need to examine this this word a bit more the common belief of a lot of people is that this word means world and so that there are different pakwa this one then higher ones up in heaven lower ones in other places and that there are different existences or different levels of existence and that these existences occur in separate distinct worlds well, we're, we're unable to to accept that or to believe in it and what we understand this to mean the meaning of of these different existences especially the three existences that the Buddha taught about are not physical realms here and then higher up where various souls or whatever go to exist but that we're talking about states of being of the mind the mind has various states of being and we can call these these becomings of the mind these existences of the mind are what is meant by pawa pawa or pope the buddha spoke of three kinds of Pope. The first kind is that when the mind is pleased with some something sensual, when the mind is derived is involved in some kind of sensual satisfaction or pleasure, it's getting its kicks out of one of the senses. Either the, the eye visual senses, the ears, nose, tongue, or body this includes sex then this is the first kind of existence gamma gamma power this is the sensual the the sensual existence and so when the mind is attracted to sensual things when it's interested in in chasing after sensual things then the mind is in a sensual state of being the next existence is the rupa rupa power this is the the realm of pure form or the pure form existence and this is when the mind is no longer interested in sensual pleasures but its interest is in what we would call pure form these are forms material things but they are not a source of sensual pleasure they're not so the interest in them is not sensual this can be things such as our possessions where we're not deriving sensual pleasure from the possessions but there is still an interest in these objects these forms this is the rupa pawa another example of this this existence is deep levels of concentration where the object is some form such as the breath something physical when the mind is very interested in deriving pleasure from these pure forms a kind of pleasure that is free of sensuality this is the second type of existence the rupa pava and then the third level of existence or state of being of the mind is when the mind is not interested in sensuality and it is no longer interested in pure forms but in this moment the mind is getting its 
seeking pleasure within the formless realm. It's seeking pleasure from things that have no form. This can be things such as abstract ideas or levels of concentration that are based not on physical objects but on immaterial or formless objects. So these are three states of being or three pawa of the mind. The mind can circle around or spin around in be around and in between these three levels. Sometimes the mind is in a sensual state of being, other times in a pure form state of being, and other times in a formless state of being. These are the three kinds of pawa, but no matter what, when the mind is caught up in these three types of existence, there is always a self. There always is a self that is, in it, that is existing and is seeking pleasure in one of these existences. And because of this self, there, which is the result of attachment, there will always be dukkha. So no matter how tiny the amount of existence on whichever of these three levels, there will still be dukkha. And so the freedom, being out from under the domination in power of these three pawa, gamma pawa, rupa pawa, and arupa pawa, being free of them is another benefit of ending attachment to the five khandhas. The eighteenth benefit is another difficult to translate thing. This one is to be im all the time. Im is the word used in Thai when after eating you have eaten enough food and then you are im. In English or in America we often say full. Other words implied in this are content but we've already used that word in a different place and satisfied which we also use in a different way so I'll use the word full but I mean it in this sense of of having eaten an adequate the kind of full we are when we've eaten enough food enough but not too much but the, the right necessary amount and then the feeling of well-being and contentment that comes with being being full or im. When we are im, that means that there are no more desires. We don't want anything. There's no hunger or craving for anything because we're full or we're complete. There's, there's no feeling of something lacking or missing that we, we must search for, that we must crave after. And so this is a feeling of great contentment and peace. So by removing any thought of self, soul, or I, or any of these illusions in the five khandhas, there will be the benefit of being always full always complete. This eternal im or spiritual fullness means that there is no longer any self, any I that wants, that desires or craves. With this with the disappearance, the fading away of this illusion of an I, of a self, then there is a constant fullness, a state of im. There's no hunger. There's no craving to get something. So there's this, this contentment which doesn't pass away. Usually, we only know this kind of feeling for a very short time, maybe a split second, because we're caught up in this craving for something, such as food, 
and then we satisfy that craving and then we have this feeling of im for a very short while and then we start craving something else because there is the self is still caught up in this craving the satisfaction of that craving and then it starts craving something else there's always this spinning round and so the the fullness is a very temporary and fleeting state but when there is no self no i then the craving disappears and so there's a perpetual automatic state of fullness which we can call spiritual fullness which is completely cool and peaceful this is the 18th benefit i believe of of the ending of attachment in the five khandas and now for the 19th benefit this is that there is no more do a go kong go there is no more egoistic i no more egoistic mind the other day we spoke about the normal level of i and mind and then the proud and arrogant level and so this arrogant level of i and mind is disappeared we had some other suggestions for this the obsessive i or the egocentric the self-centered the self-obsessed i the self-obsessed mind all these all this egocentricity all, all this egoism ends and disappears and when all this egoism all this selfishness all this self-centeredness disappears then there is no more burden of life the heavy burden of life is completely dependent on this self-obsessed i this obsession with self and when it disappears then the burden of life is put down so the ending of the i in mind is the 19th benefit the 20th benefit is that the mind will be and this <clears throat> the mind will enter the supreme level of voidness the supreme voidness you may have heard of the word sunyata before which means voidness means void of any idea or thought of i or mind but the the buddha used another word parama nutara sunyata which means the supreme transcendent voidness this is the highest possible level of voidness or of sunyata in the scriptures in various places the buddha spoke of different levels of voidness or sunyata but the very highest level is parama nutara sunyata this is the supreme transcendent level of voidness the buddha himself said that he he lived constantly in the state of parama nutara sunyata the buddha dwelt somebody asked him where does the buddha dwell and he said in the highest transcendent voidness this is where the buddha lives what it means is this is similar to something we said earlier the mind is completely free utterly free of any trace any glimmer of i or mind there is absolutely no egoistic feeling or thought anywhere the mind is completely free of all egoism of all thoughts of i mind self soul or any of the various illusions which fall under the term atta 
The mind is completely free of all of this. And so, when the Buddha was visited, say, by a king and his army, which happened a number of times, the Buddha would be at the staying somewhere, and a king would come up with a large army. And to the Buddha it was nothing, just another king with his army. Or maybe a group of millionaires would come by, rich, influential millionaires would come by to talk to the Buddha. And it was nothing. The Buddha's mind was not disturbed. It didn't get excited or agitated the way you would get if the president or prime minister of your country visited you at your home. Or maybe a group of Brahmins, of priests, would come to ask the Buddha questions or pay respects. And though these the highest, these religious teachers would come. The Buddha was not disturbed or excited by this. He remained in this state, or the, the mind remained in a state of Bharama Nutara Sunyata. Or other times, opponents, the followers of various hermits and ascetics would come to ask him questions, would try and set philosophical traps for the Buddha, and the Buddhas remain the same in this state of supreme transcendent voidness. Or beggars, or whoever came to talk to the Buddha. Sometimes great lavish spreads of food were set before the Buddha, and he wasn't excited. Other times he would go for a few days without anything to eat. Sometimes he was sick, sometimes in very good health. None of these different states disturbed the Buddha's mind. The Buddha remained dwelling in Bharama Nutara Sunyata, the highest, most supreme, transcendent voidness. This is the example that you all ought to follow. If you can begin to, to follow this, this example of supreme transcendent voidness, the absolutely utter absence of any thoughts or feelings of I or mine. This is the twentieth benefit. This will be possible through ending all attachment in the five khandhas. And now the 21st <clears throat> benefit. This one is a bit special, maybe quite special for you. The 21st benefit is that you will, re you will receive a diploma from Suan Mok. You will receive the Suan Mok diploma. The diploma which is awarded at Suan Mok for those who have successfully studied and completed this training is death before dying. This is the diploma of Suan Mok. If you successfully end all attachment to the five khandhas, then there, then the, the self will die before the body dies. So the death before dying that we're talking about is death of the atta, death of the I or self or soul, before the dying of the body. So death before dying means that the soul or self or I dies before the body dies. And so the body may continue on for who knows how long, but this illusion of a self is dead. This is the meaning of death before dying, or in Thai, die gone die, die see gone die. This is the diploma of Suan Mok, the very special 21st benefit of removing attachment to the five khanda. And now we come to the 22nd and final 
benefit from removing benefit of removing attachment in the five khandas. For those of you who don't like the diploma of Suan Mok, if this diploma doesn't seem important enough to you, then the twenty second benefit is the is to receive the diploma of the Buddha. So if you don't like Suan Mok's diploma, then you can have the Buddha's diploma. The Buddha actually used the word Barinya, which is the word used in Thailand for diplomas and certificates that students get after graduating. So the Buddha actually used the word diploma. And he said, there are three kinds of diplomas. We we'll use the Buddha's <laughs> word. The Buddha said there are three kinds of Barinya. The first Barinya is to abandon greed, to abandon raka, I should say to abandon lust, raka. The second parinya is to abandon tosa, tosa, anger. And the third is to parinya, is to abandon moha, delusion. These are the three parinya of the Buddha. If one can completely let go of all I in mind, all Atta and Ataniya, all thoughts of all egoistic, self-centered, obsessive, self um, egocentric thoughts, if these can all be let go of, all this arrogant pride revolving around the ideas and feelings about I in mind, if all this Atta and Ataniya is abandoned, then one will know surely, clearly within the mind that one has been awarded the three certificates, the three Barinya of the Buddha. The abandonment of lust, anger, and delusion. We've mentioned 22 benefits that arise from removing attachment in the five khandas. In fact, there are many more, but 22 is probably too many for you to handle in one day anyway. And so we've given you, given you this many so you can see clearly what the advantages are and what the benefits are of abandoning all attachment to the self. So we've given you this long list of benefits and if you understand even half of them, then you will appreciate the value of abandoning attachment in the five khandas. To summarize it all, we meet up with a new life. We know the new life and have the new life that is free of all heavy burdens. The new life that is free of the burden of life. And we will end today's talk on this note. Did you bring the chant mm. sheet? Paraha we pantakanta. Paraha we pantakanta. Paraha roja pukalo. อาราอารโรจะปุกขะโลอาราธานังทุกขังโลเกอาราธานังทุกขังโลเกอาราณิเคปนังสุขขังอาราณิเคพลังสุขขังนิคิปิตวาคารุงพารัง <coughs> นิคิปิตวากรุงพารังอัญญังพารังอนาดิยะอนาดิยะสมูลังตันหังอภุยหะสมูลังตันหังอภุยหะนิชาโตปารินิพุโตนิชาโตปารินิพุโตขาราหะ
ฟไฟอากิเกตหาสัพริงฮาราฮาโรจะปุคโลเดโซคอลเปอร์สันอิสเดเบอร์เดนแคเรียพาราธานังถูกขังโลเกะแคเรียนเบอร์เดนอิสัฟริงอินเดอะเวิลด์พาราเนเคปานังสุกขังโชว์อิงเอาเบอร์เดน Is not suffering. He says it's better to to chant with the translation as well. It has more meaning than just the Pali, which most of you don't know.